Saul, Hebrew, Saul modern, Saul, Tiberian, Saul, meaning, asked for, prayed for, according to the Hebrew Bible, was the first king of the kingdom of Israel and Judah. His reign, traditionally placed in the late 11th century BCE, marked a transition from a tribal society to statehood. Saul's life and reign are described in the Hebrew Bible. He was anointed by the prophet Samuel and reigned from Gibeah. He fell on his sword committing suicide to avoid capture in the battle against the Philistines at Mount Gilboa, during which three of his sons were also killed. The succession to his throne was contested by Ish-bosheth, his only surviving son, and his son-in-law David, who eventually prevailed. According to the Hebrew text of the Bible Saul was one year old when he came to the throne and reigned for two years, but scholars generally agree that the text is faulty and that a reign of twenty or twenty-two years is more probable. Biblical account The biblical accounts of Saul's life are found in the books of Samuel. House of King Saul According to the Tanakh, Saul was the son of Kish, of the family of the Matrites, and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the twelve tribes of Israel. It appears that he came from Gibeah. Saul married Ahinoam, daughter of Ahimaaz, with whom he sired four sons Jonathan, Abinadab, Malchishua and Ish-bosheth and two daughters Merab and Mihal. Saul also had a concubine named Rispa, daughter of Aya, who bore him two sons, Armani and Mephibosheth, 2 Samuel 21 verse 8. Saul died at the Battle of Mount Gilboa 1 Samuel 31 verses 3 to 6, 1 Chronicles 10 verses 3 to 6, and was buried in Zela, in the region of Benjamin 2 Samuel 21 verse 14. Three of Saul's sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua, died with him at Mount Gilboa 1 Samuel 31 verse 2, 1 Chronicles 10 verse 2. Ish-bosheth became king of Israel, at the age of 40. At David's request Abner had Mihal returned to David. Ish-bosheth reigned for two years, but after the death of Abner, was killed by two of his own captains 2 Samuel 4 verse 5. Armani and Mephibosheth Saul's sons with his concubine, Rispa, were given by David along with the five sons of Merab Saul's daughter to the Gibeonites, who killed them, 2 Samuel 21 verses 8-9 Mihal was childless 2 Samuel 6 verse 23. The only male descendant of Saul to survive was Mephibosheth, Jonathan's lame son 2 Samuel 4 verse 4, who was five years old at the time of his father's and grandfather's deaths. In time, he came under the protection of David 2 Samuel 9 verses 7 to 13. Mephibosheth had a young son, Micah 2 Samuel 9 verse 12, who had four sons and descendants named until the ninth generation 1 Chronicles 8 verses 35-38. Anointed as king The first book of Samuel gives three accounts of Saul's rise to the throne in three successive chapters. Saul is sent with a servant to look for his father's strayed donkeys. Leaving his home at Gibeah, they eventually arrive at the district of Zuf, at which point Saul suggests abandoning their search. Saul's servant tells him that they happen to be near the town of Ramah, where a famous seer is located, and suggests that they should consult him first. The seer later identified by the text as Samuel offers hospitality to Saul and later anoints him in private 1 Samuel chapter 9. A popular movement having arisen to establish a centralized monarchy like other nations, Samuel assembles the people at Mizpah in Benjamin to appoint a king, fulfilling his previous promise to do so 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel organizes the people by tribe and by clan. Using the Urim and Thummim, he selects the tribe of Benjamin, from within the tribe selecting the clan of Matri, and from them selecting Saul. After having been chosen as monarch, Saul returns to his home in Gibeah, along with a number of followers 1 Samuel 10 verses 17-24, however, some of the people are openly unhappy with the selection of Saul. The Ammonites, led by Nahash, lay siege to Jabesh-Gilead. Under the terms of surrender, the occupants of the city are to be forced into slavery and have their right eyes removed. Instead they send word of this to the other tribes of Israel, and the tribes west of the Jordan assemble an army under Saul. 
Saul leads the army to victory over the Ammonites, and the people congregate at Gilgal where they acclaim Saul as king and he is crowned 1 Samuel chapter 11. Saul's first act is to forbid retribution against those who had previously contested his kingship. Andre Lemaire finds the third account probably the most reliable tradition. The pulpit commentary distinguishes between a private and a public selection process. Topic: <laughs> Saul among the prophets. Having been anointed by Samuel, Saul is told of signs indicating that he has been divinely appointed. The last of these is that Saul will be met by an ecstatic group of prophets leaving a high place and playing the lyre, tambourine, and flutes. Saul encounters the ecstatic prophets and joins them. Later, Saul sends men to pursue David, but when they meet a group of ecstatic prophets playing music, they become possessed by a prophetic state and join in. Saul sends more men, but they too join the prophets. Eventually Saul himself goes, and also joins the prophets, 1 Samuel chapter 19 verse 24. <inaudible> <inaudible> military victories After relieving the siege of Jabesh Gilead, Saul conducts military campaigns against the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Aram Rehob and the kings of Zobah, the Philistines, and the Amalekites 1 Samuel 14 verse 47. A biblical summary states that, "...wherever he turned, he was victorious." In his continuing battles with Philistines, Saul instructs his armies, by a rash oath, to fast. Methodist commentator Joseph Benson suggests that, Saul's intention in putting this oath was undoubtedly to save time, lest the Philistines should gain ground of them in their flight. But the event showed it was a false policy, for the people were so faint and weak for want of food, that they were less able to follow and slay the Philistines than if they had stopped to take a moderate refreshment. Jonathan's party were not aware of the oath and ate honey, resulting in Jonathan realizing that he had broken an oath of which he was not aware, but was nevertheless liable for its breach, until popular intervention allowed Jonathan to be saved from death on account of his victory over the Philistines. Rejection Saul planned a military action against the Philistines. Samuel said that he would arrive in seven days to perform the requisite rites. When a week passed with no word of Samuel, and with the Israelites growing restless, Saul prepares for battle by offering sacrifices. Samuel arrives just as Saul is finishing sacrificing and reprimands Saul for not obeying his instructions. Later Samuel instructs Saul to make war on the Amalekites and to utterly destroy them, in fulfillment of a mandate set out Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 19. When the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies on every hand, in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget, having forewarned the Kenites who were living among the Amalekites to leave, Saul goes to war and defeats the Amalekites. Saul kills all the men, women, children and poor quality livestock, but leaves alive the king and best livestock. When Samuel learns that Saul has not obeyed his instructions in full, he informs Saul that God has rejected him as king due to his disobedience. As Samuel turns to go, Saul seizes hold of his garments and tears off a piece. Samuel prophecies that the kingdom will likewise be torn from Saul. Samuel then kills the Amalekite king himself. Samuel and Saul each return home and never meet again after these events. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verses 33 to 35. Saul and David After Samuel tells Saul that God has rejected him as king, David, a son of Jesse, from the tribe of Judah, enters the story. From this point on, Saul's story is largely the account of his increasingly troubled relationship with David. Samuel heads to Bethlehem, ostensibly to offer sacrifice, and invited Jesse and his sons. Dining together, Jess's sons are brought one by one to Samuel, each being rejected. At last, Jesse sends for David, the youngest, who is tending sheep. When brought to Samuel, David is anointed by him in front of his other brothers. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 verses 14 to 23, Saul is troubled by an evil spirit sent by God. 
He requests soothing music, and a servant recommends David the son of Jesse, who is renowned for his skills as a harpist and other talents, a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. When word of Saul's needs reaches Jesse, he sends David, who had been looking after Jesse's flock, with gifts as a tribute, and David is appointed as Saul's armor-bearer. With Jess's permission he remains at court, playing the harp as needed to calm Saul during his troubled spells. 1 Samuel 17 verse 15 suggests David only attended court periodically. 1 Samuel 17 verse 1-18-5 The Philistines return with an army to attack Israel, and the Philistine and Israelite forces gather on opposite sides of a valley. The Philistines' champion Goliath issues a challenge for single combat, but none of the Israelite accept. David is described as a young shepherd who happens to be delivering food to his three eldest brothers in the army, and he hears Goliath's challenge. David speaks mockingly of the Philistines to some soldiers, his speech is overheard and reported to Saul, who summons David and appoints David as his champion. David easily defeats Goliath with a single shot from a sling. At the end of the passage, Saul asks his general, Abner, who David is. Saul offered his elder daughter Merab as a wife to the now popular David, after his victory over Goliath, but David demurred. David distinguishes himself in the Philistine Wars. Upon David's return from battle, the women praise him in song. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands implying that David is the greater warrior. Saul fears David's growing popularity and henceforth views him as a rival to the throne. Saul's son Jonathan and David become close friends. Jonathan recognizes David as the rightful king, and made a covenant with David, because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan even gives David his military clothes, symbolizing David's position as successor to Saul. On two occasions, Saul threw a spear at David as he played the harp for Saul. David becomes increasingly successful and Saul becomes increasingly resentful. Now Saul actively plots against David. Saul offered his other daughter, Michal in marriage to David. David initially rejects this offer also, claiming he is too poor. Saul offers to accept a bride price of 100 Philistine foreskins, intending that David die in the attempt. Instead, David obtains 200 foreskins and is consequently married to Michal. Jonathan arranges a short-lived reconciliation between Saul and David and for a while David served Saul. As in times past. 1 Samuel chapter 19 verses 1 to 7 until the distressing spirit from the Lord reappeared. Saul sends assassins in the night, but Michal helps him escape, tricking them by placing a household idol in his bed. David flees to Jonathan, who arranges a meeting with his father. While dining with Saul, Jonathan explains David's absence, saying he has been called away to his brothers. But Saul sees through the ruse and reprimands Jonathan for protecting David, warning him that his love of David will cost him the kingdom, furiously throwing a spear at him. The next day, Jonathan meets with David and tells him Saul's intent. The two friends say their goodbyes, and David flees into the countryside. Saul later marries Michal to another man. Saul is later informed by his head shepherd, Doeg the Edomite, that high priest Ahimelech assisted David, giving him the sword of Goliath, which had been kept at the temple at Nob. Doeg kills Ahimelech and 85 other priests and Saul orders the death of the entire population of Nob. David had left Nob by this point and had amassed some 300 disaffected men including some outlaws. With these men David rescues the town of Kala from a Philistine attack. Saul realizes he could trap David and his men by laying the city to siege. David realizes that the citizens of Kala will betray him to Saul. He flees to Ziph pursued by Saul. Saul hunts David in the vicinity of Ziph on two occasions. Some of the inhabitants of Ziph betray David's location to Saul, but David hears about it and flees with his men to Maon. Saul follows David, but is forced to break off pursuit when the Philistines invade. After dealing with that threat Saul tracks David to the caves at Engedi. As he searches the cave David manages to cut off a piece of Saul's robe without being discovered, yet David restrains his men from harming the king. David then leaves the cave, revealing himself to Saul, and gives a speech that persuades Saul to reconcile. On the second occasion, Saul returns to Ziph with his men. When David hears of this, he slips into Saul's camp by night, and again restrains his men from killing the king, instead he steals Saul's spear and water jug, leaving his own spear thrust into the ground by Saul's side. 
The next day, David reveals himself to Saul, showing the jug and spear as proof that he could have slain him. David then persuades Saul to reconcile with him, the two swear never to harm each other. After this they never see each other again. <laughs> Battle of Gilboa and the death of King Saul The Philistines make war again, assembling at Shunem, and Saul leads his army to face them at Mount Gilboa. Before the battle he goes to consult a medium or witch at Endor. The medium, unaware of his identity, reminds him that the king has made witchcraft a capital offense, but he assures her that Saul will not harm her. She conjures the spirit of the prophet Samuel, who before his death had prophesied that he would lose the kingdom. Samuel tells him that God has fully rejected him, will no longer hear his prayers, has given the kingdom to David and that the next day he will lose both the battle and his life. Saul collapses in fear, and the medium restores him with food in anticipation of the next day's battle. 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel give conflicting accounts of Saul's death. In 1 Samuel, and in a parallel account in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, as the defeated Israelites flee, Saul asks his armor-bearer to kill him, but he refuses, and so Saul falls upon his own sword. In 2 Samuel, an Amalekite tells David he found Saul leaning on his spear after the battle and delivered the coup de grace. David has the Amalekite put to death for accusing himself of killing the anointed king. The victorious Philistines recover Saul's body as well as those of his three sons who also died in the battle, decapitated them and displayed them on the wall of Beth Shan. They display Saul's armor in the Temple of Ashtoreth an Ascalonian temple of the Canaanites. But at night the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead retrieve the bodies for cremation and burial 1 Samuel chapter 31 verses 8 to 13, 1 Chronicles 10-12. Later on, David takes the bones of Saul and of his son Jonathan and buries them in Zela, in the tomb of his father 2 Samuel chapter 21 verses 12 to 14. The account in 1 Chronicles summarizes by stating that Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. Biblical criticism There are several textual or narrative issues in the text, including the aforementioned conflicting accounts of Saul's rise to kingship and his death, as well as plays on words, that biblical scholars have discussed. The birth narrative of the prophet Samuel is found at 1 Samuel chapters 1-28. It describes how Samuel's mother Hannah requests a son from Yahweh, and dedicates the child to God at the shrine of Shiloh. The passage makes extensive play with the root elements of Saul's name, and ends with the phrase Hu Saul la Yahweh, he is dedicated to Yahweh. Hannah names the resulting son Samuel, giving as her explanation, because from God I requested him. Samuel's name, however, can mean, name of God, or, heard of God, or, told of God, and the etymology and multiple references to the root of the name seems to fit Saul instead. The majority explanation for the discrepancy is that the narrative originally described the birth of Saul, and was given to Samuel in order to enhance the position of David and Samuel at the former king's expense. The Bible's tone with regard to Saul changes over the course of the narrative, especially around the passage where David appears, midway through 1 Samuel. Before, Saul is presented in positive terms, but afterward his mode of ecstatic prophecy is suddenly described as fits of madness, his errors and disobedience to Samuel's instructions are stressed and he becomes a paranoiac. This may indicate that the David story is inserted from a source loyal to the house of David. David's lament over Saul in 2 Samuel chapter 1 then serves an apologetic purpose, clearing David of the blame for Saul's death. God's apparent change of mind in rejecting Saul as king has raised questions about God's repentance, which could be considered as inconsistent with God's immutability. In the King James Version, God's word to Samuel states, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Samuel's words later clarify that God's repentance is not like human regret or reconsideration. The strength of Israel will not lie nor relent. For he is not a man, that he should relent. Methodist biblical commentator Joseph Benson writes that, Repentance, properly speaking, implies grief of heart, and a change of counsels. Understood in which sense, it can have no place in God. 
but it is often ascribed to him in the scriptures when he alters his method of dealing with persons, and treats them as if he did indeed repent of the kindness he had shown them." In the books of Samuel, Saul is not referred to as a king but rather as a leader or commander. Nagad, 1 Samuel chapter 9 verse 16, 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 1. However, Saul is also said to be made a king. Melich at Gilgal, 1 Samuel chapter 11 verse 15. Various authors have attempted to harmonize the two narratives regarding Saul's death. Josephus writes that Saul's attempted suicide was stalled because he was not able to run the sword through himself and that he therefore asked the Amalekite to finish it. Later biblical criticism has posited that the story of Saul's death was redacted from various sources, although this view in turn has been criticized because it does not explain why the contradiction was left in by the redactors. But since 2 Samuel records only the Amalekites' report, and not the report of any other eyewitness, some scholars theorize that the Amalekite may have been lying to try to gain favor with David. On this view, 1 Samuel records what actually happened, while 2 Samuel records what the Amalekite claims happened. Topic. Classical rabbinical views Two opposing views of Saul are found in classical rabbinical literature. One is based on the reverse logic that punishment is a proof of guilt, and therefore seeks to rob Saul of any halo which might surround him. Typically this view is similar to the Republican source. The passage referring to Saul as a choice young man, and goodly 1 Samuel chapter 9 verse 2 is in this view interpreted as meaning that Saul was not good in every respect, but goodly only with respect to his personal appearance Num. Rashi 9 According to this view, Saul is only a weak branch Gen. Rashi 25-3, owing his kingship not to his own merits, but rather to his grandfather, who had been accustomed to light the streets for those who went to the Bet Ha Midrash, and had received as his reward the promise that one of his grandsons should sit upon the throne Lev. Rashi 9-2 the second view of Saul makes him appear in the most favorable light as man, as hero, and as king. This view is similar to that of the monarchical source. In this view it was on account of his modesty that he did not reveal the fact that he had been anointed king 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 16, Meg, 13b, and he was extraordinarily upright as well as perfectly just. Nor was there any one more pious than he MQ 16b, X. Rashi 30-12, for when he ascended the throne he was as pure as a child, and had never committed sin Yoma 22b. He was marvelously handsome, and the maidens who told him concerning Samuel cf. 1 Samuel chapter 9 verses 11 to 13 talked so long with him that they might observe his beauty the more ber. 48b. In war he was able to march 120 miles without rest. When he received the command to smite Amalek 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 3, Saul said, For one found slain the Torah requires a sin offering Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 1 to 9, and here so many shall be slain. If the old have sinned, why should the young suffer, and if men have been guilty, why should the cattle be destroyed? It was this mildness that cost him his crown. And while Saul was merciful to his enemies, he was strict with his own people. When he found out that Ahimelech, a Kohen, had assisted David with finding food, Saul, in retaliation, killed the rest of the 85 Kohanim of the family of Ahimelech and the rest of his hometown, November Yoma 22b, Num. Rashi 1.10 The fact that he was merciful even to his enemies, being indulgent to rebels themselves, and frequently waving the homage due to him, was incredible as well as deceiving. But if his mercy toward a foe was a sin, it was his only one, and it was his misfortune that it was reckoned against him, while David, although he had committed much iniquity, was so favored that it was not remembered to his injury Yoma 22b, MQ 16b, and Rashi ad -Lok. In some respects Saul was superior to David, e.g., in having only one concubine Rispa, while David had many. Saul expended his own substance for the war, and although he knew that he and his sons would fall in battle, he nevertheless went forward, while David heeded the wish of his soldiers not to go to war in person 2 Samuel chapter 21 verse 17, Lev. Rashi 26-7, Y-A-L-Q, Sam, 138. According to the rabbis, Saul ate his food with due regard for the rules of ceremonial purity prescribed for the sacrifice Yalq, L, C, and taught the people how they should slay cattle cf. 1 Samuel chapter 14 verse 34. 
As a reward for this, God himself gave Saul a sword on the day of battle, since no other sword suitable for him was found Saul's attitude toward David finds its excuse in the fact that his courtiers were all tale-bearers, and slandered David to him doi. Rashi 5:10, and in like manner he was incited by Doeg against the priests of Nob. 1 Samuel chapter 22 verses 16 to 19. Yalq Sam 131. This act was forgiven him, however, and a heavenly voice bat qol was heard, proclaiming, Saul is the chosen one of God. Ber 12b. His anger at the Gibeonites, 2 Samuel chapter 21 verse 2, was not personal hatred, but was induced by zeal for the welfare of Israel. Num. Rashi 8 to 4. The fact that he made his daughter remarry, 1 Samuel chapter 25 verse 44, finds its explanation in his Saul's view that her betrothal to David had been gained by false pretenses and was therefore invalid. Sanhedrin 19b. During the lifetime of Saul, there was no idolatry in Israel. The famine in the reign of David cf 2 Samuel chapter 21 verse 1 was to punish the people, because they had not accorded Saul the proper honors at his burial Num. Rashi 8 In Shoal, Samuel reveals to Saul that in the next world, Saul would dwell with Samuel, which is a proof that all has been forgiven him by God er, 53 ba. Topic. In Islam. Some Muslims refer to Saul as Talut Arabic, Talwit and believe that as in the Bible, he was the commander of Israel. Other scholars, however, have identified Talut as Gideon with the reasoning that the Quran references the same incident of the drinking from the river as that found in Judges chapter 7 verses 5 to 7 and other factors associated with Gideon. According to the Quran, Talut was chosen by the prophet Samuel, not mentioned by name explicitly, but rather as a prophet of the Israelites after being asked by the people of Israel for a king to lead them into war. The Israelites criticized Samuel for appointing Talut, lacking respect for Talut because he was not wealthy. Samuel rebuked the people for this and told them that Talut was more favored than they were. Talut led the Israelites to victory over the army of Goliath, who was killed by Dawud David. Talut is not considered a Nabi Arabic, Nabi prophet, but a divinely appointed king. Topic. Name The name Talut has uncertain etymology. Unlike some other Quranic figures, the Arabic name is not similar to the Hebrew name Shaul. According to Muslim exegetes, the name Talut means tall from the Arabic tool and refers to the extraordinary stature of Saul, which would be consistent with the biblical account. In explanation of the name, exegetes such as Thalabi hold that at this time, the future king of Israel was to be recognized by his height. Samuel set up a measure, but no one in Israel reached its height except to loot Saul. Topic: <laughs> Saul as the king of Israel. In the Quran, Israelites demanded a king after the time of Musa, Moses. God appointed Talut as their king. Saul was distinguished by the greatness of his knowledge and of his physique, it was a sign of his role as king that God brought back the Ark of the Covenant for Israel. Talut tested his people at a river, whoever drank from it would not follow him in battle excepting one who takes from it in the hollow of his hand. Many drank but only the faithful ventured on. In the battle, however, David slew Goliath and was made the subsequent king of Israel. The Quranic account differs from the biblical account if Saul is assumed to be Talut in that in the Bible the sacred ark was returned to Israel before Saul's accession, and the test by drinking water is made in the Hebrew Bible not by Saul but by Gideon. However, the story of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 14 has parallels to Quran 2 to 246 minus 251, faithfully accounting for the sacred ark and the fasting test. 1 Samuel chapter 14 verse 18, 1 Samuel chapter 14 verses 24 to 48, Quran 2 to 246 minus 251, translated by Yusuf Ali. Topic. Historicity The historicity of Saul's kingdom is not universally accepted and there is insufficient extrabiblical evidence to verify if the biblical account reflects historical reality. 
The notion of a united monarchy of Israel and Judah is believed by some scholars to be a later ideological construct. Statehood in Judah is thought, on the basis of archaeological evidence, to have emerged no earlier than the 8th century BCE. Saul's kingdom was not very large. It probably included Mount Ephraim, Benjamin, and Gilead. He also exerted some influence in the northern mountains in Judah and beyond the Jezreel Valley. His capital appears to have been basically a military camp near Gibeah. Archaeology seems to confirm that until about 1000 BCE, the end of Iron Age I, Israelite society was essentially a society of farmers and stockbreeders without any truly centralized organization and administration. Topic: <laughs> Psychological analyses. Accounts of Saul's behavior have made him a popular subject for speculation among modern psychiatrists. George Stein views the passages depicting Saul's ecstatic episodes as suggesting that he may have suffered from mania. Martin Hussman sees the story of Saul as illustrative of the role of stress as a factor in depression. Liubav ben Naun of Ben Gurion University of the Negev believes that passages referring to King Saul's disturbed behavior indicate he was afflicted by a mental disorder, and lists a number of possible conditions. However, Christopher C. H. Cook of the Department of Theology and Religion, Durham University, UK recommends caution in offering any diagnoses in relation to people who lived millennia ago. See also David in Islam Kings of Israel and Judah Midrash Samuel Paul the Apostle, formerly named Saul of Tarsus as a Pharisee.